and I did my selection with Ten Para, and I I um, I joined Ten the Ten Battalion of Parachute Regiment. Poached and approached by BBC Radio One, and I joined Radio One, and I was there for seven years on a prime time Saturday night. They did the same thing with punk. Radio's Pretty Faces was Phil Campion chasing a forces radio presenter. Pumped up and in the party mood across the land and everyone, and it was a great decade, the 90s. Danny, how are you, brother? I'm good, Chris. How are you? I'm phenomenal, mate, and I'm uh, even more phenomenal to not just have people like you in my life, but to be talking to the man himself today. <laughs> well, the sun's shining. It's Wednesday afternoon, and I, by the looks of things, after this interview, I'll be going to get in the channel. I haven't been in for a week, so I know that the temperature is going down rapidly, so... Game for an invigorating dip in the channel. <laughs> oh, cold water immersion, isn't it? Good? Absolutely. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Really good. Yes. Yeah, so I noticed um for, on your Instagram you you've been you you very spiritual, um, taking a, the beautiful photos of the sunsets. It's really important, isn't it, at times of stress that we 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 take a bit of time for ourselves and, and just remember that despite the freaking nonsense that's going on yeah the universe is an incredible place and we all we all have our place in it don't we yeah a very kind of small place in the grand scale of the universe but I, i'm just very grateful to wake up in the morning to uh well you know it's not a spectacular sunrise every day but when they are spectacular they certainly are and the same for sunset so i you know i get up early and i like to I like to see the sun coming up as much as I can on the weekends when I'm DJing. I, you know, I'm at work till you know maybe two or four in the morning, so I don't see as many sunsets on Saturday night, Sunday morning. But I make a point of of, of waking and looking at the sunset, and then a fifteen minute meditation. And all of this really, you know, I, I've always been um, uh, started the day with gratitude, um, and at night going to sleep with gratitude is very important. I feel, um, for one's well being. but getting up in the morning meditation is, um, I think uh, as a result of this crisis we've been in, um, that's really prompted me to embark on meditation and it's uh, a really good thing to do, uh, um, daily. It's an absolute lifesaver, mate, isn't it really? It's funny, isn't it? If you'd said this to me, I don't know, 10 years, maybe yeah, maybe 10 years ago, I'd have just thought that's some hippie shit. I ain't doing that crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's recentering re energy and decluttering the mind of, you know, all the noise that's going on around us. And right now it's really blooming noisy, isn't it? Ah, uh, it is. It is. So I was going to ask you, are you, are you like a Londoner by trade? Is, is that... It, I was born in London. I lived there for 50 plus years and I've been on the coast um, in East Sussex for close to 11 years now. And I, you know, I love it here because um, it's pretty laid back. Um, there's uh, low traffic emissions, lots of open land to uh, tab on and uh, go for long hikes. Seven Sisters, one of the uh, most beautiful landmarks in the UK. Um, along with the Jurassic Coast and other parts. Uh, that's just on the doorstep. So, yeah, you know, kind of walking. And again, I mean, the, the cold water immersion, I only started in March last year. And I've lived here years. I look at the sea and think, no, that looks a bit cold. But, um, yeah, the benefits have been and continue to be profound. Yeah. Yeah, massively. So I was just up your way, wasn't I? We stayed in Weymouth uh for the summer holiday, not for the half term holiday. Yeah. Um, we got a modest little hotel, but it was l literally the cliche hundred meters from the beach. Yeah. So every morning I was in that sea. Yeah. And, well and I, 
I've got low blood pressure, so I get a bit of Raynaud's syndrome quite quite easily. But yeah, I managed that. No problem. I was just I was it, it wasn't a big shocker or anything. It's just yeah. straight in. I won't yeah. say I stayed in there a long time, but long enough to give me a buzz for the day. Exactly. And that's the thing. It's, you know, uh, the benefits of the cardio- cardiovascular system and inflammation and um, uh, blood pressure also. So and mental health and well-being. Uh, and that's why the cold water um, therapy immersion has really become hugely popular since the, uh, the uh, uh, this crisis um, emerged mm-hmm. and more people are getting in the sea uh, more than ever. So here locally, there's there's an unofficial club and people meet three times a day, you know, certain points of the day you can go along, meet other like-minded people and, and people are in the sea um, with other people around because particularly with the cold water, it's not, you know, really the thing to do is to just get in there on your own without any support around it, just in case there is any difficulties as such. Mm. Wouldn't it be great when you bear in mind, right, Something that we've forgotten in this country is that the politicians work for us, not the other, you know, you could pay money to push them in the sea. (laughs) It's a new sport. Uh, uh, That's a great idea for uh, winter 21-22. Push a politician into the cold water. Yes. Shake some common sense into them. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or freeze some common sense in. <laughs> yes. You've got to have a bit of humour, haven't you? Well, you have, mate. they just got to be lucky if they don't live near a volcano. <laughs> uh, yes. Hey, yeah. you never guess what I found on the hint, hint, Jurassic Coast. Oh, yeah. Found a fossil, mate. Actually did. We went to that beach where all the, the holiday makers go to chip the rocks open. And yeah. And um, my boy's massively he loves his dinosaurs and stuff. And yeah. to be honest, I wasn't, I wasn't a hundred percent. Sh- I have seen this narrative out there that dinosaurs never existed, mm. and I've never really come in contact other than go into the, the the natural history museum and, and stuff. And the way that narrative, without going into one, but yes. they, they yeah. explain it that over the years people have found like a ancient elephants hip bone and then they say that it's like oh this is tyrannosaurus da, da, da. so like a lot of these narratives it, it can actually sound quite convincing but on the jurassic coast i yeah. found a fossilized shell yeah incredible um and when we went in the little museum there there's lots of complete skeletons of of dinosaur like sea creatures um it was quite an eye-opener yeah, I haven't really explored the Jurassic Coast, but it's been on my list for quite some time. So, yeah, maybe um, uh, in the new year or the spring of next year. A lovely part of the country. But, yeah, fossil so, hunting, brilliant. So let's talk about your time as death from the sky. <laughs> that surprised me to hear. <laughs> uh, I've gone through a lot in my life and um, life is a series of experiences and adventures. That's my, you know, I think uh, that's my own personal uh, view. But um, yeah, my grandfather was a military man. Um, he served in the territorial army before the um, British expedition force in 1939 went into Europe. And he was a member of the, um, Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Regiment, um, which later became the Royal Green Jacket. So he was uh, a long-standing military career man. And I lived with him as a uh, young man, and uh, he influenced me greatly. And I wanted to follow in his footsteps, and um, he was a great inspiration to me. So um, I uh, wanted to join the uh, regular army, and um, I spent a year training um, and I wanted to join the parachute regiment and I went to Sutton Coalfield. I did all the fitness and, um, you know, kind of actually I was so, so fit. It was, it was a pretty much a doddle actually, the BFT at Sutton Coalfield. That's where um, selection center was back then in the eighties. And I had an interview with the uh, Colonel as you do. He was like a, 
um, a, a, an army officer like out of one of those uh, 70s films with his dog sitting close to him this uh, and um, all of his you know kind of military uh, career pictures on the wall and certification I had this interview um, I don't know whether it was the interview or uh, the fact that I was a bit cocky on the pull-ups with a ferocious looking um, uh, bloke who was a captain in the parachute regiment coincidentally um, and I made the mistake of saying is that it after I think it was about 20 or 25 pull-ups is that it and I didn't address him as sir or anything and should have kept my mouth shut and I think it I think it could have been that that got me kind of my card marks um, and uh, he exploded in a rage of um, um, language that we won't repeat on here and um, doubled them up which I I did and I think that marked my card. So um, at the interview, uh, they said to me that um, uh, you're, uh, you haven't uh, made the uh, grade for the regiment, but you can join another regiment. And I said, well, I've only come here to join <laughs> the parachute regiment. I was very young um, at that time. I think I was 20 years old or something. Uh, so I went off very, very greatly disappointed um, that I hadn't um, I got through um uh, with my ambition there at Sutton Kilford. I went home anyway, to cut long story short. Uh, my grandfather said to me, well, it's, you know, it's a bit of a disappointment, but um, you could always join the Territorial Army, which is where where I was before I was in the regular army. And to be honest, I didn't really know a great deal about the TA at that time. So he gave me the number of the Duke of York's headquarters in Kings Road, Chelsea. I went along there and I did my selection with 10 para and I... I um, I joined 10, the 10th Battalion of the Parachute Regiment. So I really, looking back on it, I had the best of both worlds because I was just starting to DJ at that time as well. And it was a great experience. It taught me a lot about resilience, motivation, and um, I am very proud to have um, partly followed in his footsteps and given some service and uh, learned a great deal from that about myself. And it made, it turned a bit of an unruly lad into a man. That's how I viewed that, that transition po process. And um, I'm immensely proud of that achievement because uh, out of Al Qaeda, there was 130 men uh, embarked on the Qaeda in Aldershot and 13 of us passed on, 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 um, Malta Barracks Parade Square and being given that red beret, as you know yourself, you were given a green beret, beret. It's one of the greatest days of your life with the endurance that you go through and the challenges and the determination and the um, motivation to, 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 to achieve that. So, yeah, that was a part of my life that I am really proud of and it set the benchmark I, I believe, for all that has followed a successful DJ career. that I'm still um, DJing across the uh, country at the moment. Of course, the world travel has uh, uh, has been impacted by this, uh, this crisis for many of us. And I don't really have the desire to travel overseas at present until things um, stabilise and level out with what we've got going on here on home soil. So, yeah, uh, all part of one's rich life experiences. Did, did you get to jump, Danny? Yes, I did, yeah. I went to Bryce Norton on a wings course, uh, which is a two-week course. Um, but on my sev seventh jump, there were eight jumps at that time. On the seventh jump, I creamed in with a container. I released the container. The container hit, hit the DZ, and I for a split second thought that I was um, about to land and I was still uh, uh, 10 feet above the ground, 10 feet, 15 feet. And I came in a, in an abnormal land landing and smashed my shoulders in, dislocated one of them. So um, yeah, I was pretty gutty because I had one more jump to do another container jump. And um, so um, my wings were compromised. I went back there, um, some months later, and the transport never collected me and another bloke who was um, uh, who was going back to do uh, one more jump to get the wings. So unfortunately, uh, the parachuting side of it 
that was my only uh, experience of uh, the, the jumping side of things. But there are blokes in the regiment now that have spent three years and, you know, kind of still haven't uh, qualified for that. And now it's five jumps where it was at eight, eight in the 80s. And did you do your first one from the balloon? Yeah. Yeah. Eerie silence and step forward and out. But just look up, <laughs> look up. That's I think that's what got me through. And just you know, head to the sky. Just do not look down. <laughs> yes, I'm gonna find a little clip while we're. Talking. I can still remember that now. It's uh, I mean, that's such a um, that first experience. You've done it yourself, clearly. Um, the silence is eerie. It's a, a really eerie silence, and of course, there's a level of fear. Um, and, you know, you can't say that there's no fear in stepping out of like a stationary balloon with, you know, kind of this just views across the countryside <laughs> in complete silence. <laughs> but it's a test of your fear, overcoming fear. That's one of the first tests before you actually get into an aircraft. Yeah, so I won't bore you with my anecdotes, but I, I literally couldn't show fear because as a, a corporal with, I think, about three or four years' service under my belt by that time, I, I was in the basket with three baby paras. So when they said, who's going to be first out, it's like, me. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> fellas, but it, it, it's, this is the way it's going to be. And <laughs> Just get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, it was the Geronimo that... Um, made everybody laugh well not the powers they were their mind was quite preoccupied but the the jump instructor was like bro yeah what do you mean fucking geronimo <laughs> <laughs> friendly push and out you went <laughs> yeah that's um that's a great that's the great thing about um let, let's not talk about the global veterans alliance at the moment but um it's i love working with the powers back then they lo lo lovely lads you know we we, we there was always supposed to be this rivalry and I never saw it. Um, and now to be marching through London <laughs> with, you know, with a para on your left shoulder and an army compatriot on the right and then a Royal Air Force and a, and a Navy, et cetera, et cetera. It's just um, bloody great, you know? Yeah, great day. Yeah. You would a lot have of respect. You would have missed the um, night jump then, I'm guessing. Yeah. Thank heavens. <laughs> yeah. That was funny. You just hear all these Gurkhas creaming in. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Stuck in trees. <laughs> yeah. Great. So, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, great experience and wouldn't have missed it for the world, but uh, all part of one's character and who we are as um, individuals. Mm. And um, did, did yeah, you, I mean, did, it was great, great tribute to my grandfather. And that's why um, I'll just say this rounding off on that Remembrance um, Sunday. I mean, it's, I, I remember him most days, but particularly on Remembrance Sunday, because um, he uh, never went to Remembrance Sunday parade in Whitehall and he was invited there. Um, he, he was, um, you know, he was uh, he was. I don't know. He he travelled the world and that uh, Singapore and India and Europe and um, he didn't want to go overseas anymore. And kind of he didn't um, participate in any of the military stuff after the war, you know, parades and things. He 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 went and gave service again in the Territorial Army. But on Remembrance Sunday, that is my day of, uh, of ultimate remembrance for my grandfather. Mm. So, yeah, that we all have a... Uh, um, a, 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 a special uh, sense of remembrance, I think. Anybody who's uh, served in the military or has a military family on that given day. Yes, and um, I think we are, there's, there's been no greater time to honour the, the, the sacrifice that, that many of these, I won't say brave individuals because some of them were just bloody children. Um, probably weren't brave, probably absolutely terrified, but they still went over the top, didn't they, for our freedom yeah. and the freedom of future generations. And um, when you start... Our freedoms, yeah. Yeah, when you start talking about silly nonsense such as uh, passports and 
this guy can go in that club, but that guy, sorry, you that 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 is not on. It's just simply such a dis dishonor. Absolutely. Um, but look, <laughs> here uh, we go. Here we go. Well, we'll we'll have a, a minor rent, but it mm. it just feels like history is repeating, and also on the other hand, history has been erased, uh, and the the merits and the whole reason for that has just been completely like you know sidetracked. Oh, that does you know that doesn't matter. Where we're at at the moment, we're very in a very strange time. A very yes. very strange time. Yes, and um, it's it's just a wee bit more up uh, set in there. Danny went okay. You could understand for maybe civilians that have never served, that have never lost colleagues, that have never you know had colleagues die on in in, in conflict, etc. To not honour this commitment that, that that hundreds of thousands, millions made. But so many service personnel are just going along with this narrative, aren't they? Just because it oh. makes it, you know, some of them are blissfully unaware. That's the nature of the matrix, isn't it? Mm. But some are aware, but they're just going along with it because it makes their life easier and they get, you know, they get their TV contract or what, what, whatever the thing may be for next year and um, or they can get on an aeroplane and, do that and it, it, it's a is a temptation there to be a bit upset about that you know well i think we have a very divided um society um right now it's very 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 clear and personally i think you know, it's uh, it's levels of consciousness and um consciousness is a frequency and we all have a, a different uh level of consciousness and i think that's playing a, ma- a major role in what we're experiencing here, um, uh, the d- divide of uh, fa- friends, family, business, uh, uh, mm. businesses, uh, co-workers, you know, um, associations, uh, uh, just it's uh, sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, aunties, uncles, you name it. Uh, you know, everybody is experiencing some form of divide as much as you want to rise above that not everybody is able and has the capacity um consciously to rise above the division and um it's a very very dark time that we're we've never never seen anything like this it's Mm -hmm. um it's it's hard to fathom out at times but that Personally, that's what I, you know, I feel it is. It's just le- different levels of consciousness, and some people are further back along the road of consciousness, and from, some people are further ahead. But I do feel that those people will catch up, and we meet in the middle somewhere. Which this cannot go on like this. Uh, this is just uh, not the world that uh, we desire to uh, live in. You know, we're here to shape a better world, and that's what we're doing. Yes, exactly. We're, we're enabling people to win the spiritual battle. Where is the spiritual battle played out? Is it in the physical? Nope. It's in the pineal gland, in the brain. It's with the chemicals that this clever thing produces and that certain uh, elements in society very well know how to control. And once we can enlighten people as to this, we're going to get the outcome that humanity deserves, Danny, aren't we? Yep, and um, I firmly believe that. I, you know, uh, hope, faith, and uh, intentionality are so important in these days that we are living in, these times and the experiences we're going through. Mm. Hope is very, very important right now. Yes, let's keep the vibration up, folks. Exactly. Uh, keep raising the vibration. Yeah. Let's talk about music then. One of my favourite subjects. Um, this might surprise we we share. We've got quite a lot in common, Danny. Um, I was actually DJ of the biggest nightclub in southern China. Wow. Uh, yeah, it, it <laughs> it's just it's just one of those silly things that you end up doing in life. Yeah. I got sacked uh, literally within about a week. Um, but the, the, that's, not the, that's not the interesting thing. The interesting thing was I blagged the job. I'd never, DJ, I'd never DJed in this sense in my life. Yeah. 
the last time I played a record was when you had those red <laughs> vinyl boxes. You could stick yeah. a stack of 45s on and put, put the little arm on, right? And I went I, I went to my favourite nightclub in Hong Kong where I knew um, Roy was his name. He's Ray in my book. And I said, Roy, can I go in the DJ box and write down the name of the tracks? Because I, I danced them every <laughs> night. I, I, I don't know what they're called. And so I'm in there and, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm writing down like K class and all this sort of stuff went off to China. <laughs> oh, while I was in the DJ box, writing them down in Hong Kong in the early part of the evening, you have a Filipino band playing, right? Mm. And then the band disappeared and the DJ comes on. So the band finished and they came over to the DJ box. They went, okay, over to you. <laughs> I'm like, uh, it's okay. not me. <laughs> but, Put the headphones on one ear because that's what I know. You put them on one. one. I think, right, is that, oh, that's the slider, right? Yeah, that. Oh, A, A and B. Oh, yeah, that's that's this track. And, and I just cued in this track and it was the first three mixes were just perfect. And Brilliant. Every, everyone got up and dancing and, 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 the, and the, I got it. You know, I got what it is to be a DJ. This is great. Brilliant. And then the fourth mix was, it sounded like a herd of left of handcuffed Mustangs <laughs> crashing down a flight of stairs. <laughs> um, but yeah, ha, ha, where did your love for music start and what, what, what were you into? Uh, my love for music started at a very young age uh, through my mother having the radio on in the house. Um, my father worked in a print, so... He'd either be sleeping during the day or he'd be at, at work or out with the dog. So um, he worked nights at the weekends um, and he worked days um, during the week. Um, so she'd always have the radio on in the kitchen and stuff. And I, I just got fascinated by the radio. I loved um, records at family parties. I used to put the records on. I just loved music from a very young age. And, I, you know, kind of the, the radio was... Um, my obsession, how, you know, a, a, a radio show was broadcast and where, you know, my imagination was, imagination was, I want, you know, kind of making this picture of the studio on, on a ship somewhere in the, uh, you know, kind of off the coast in the Atlantic or something like that. And um, yeah, just uh, that's where it started really and collecting records. So at a very young age and I wanted to be on the radio. Um, it was either that, um, the, the the radio uh, farming, um, a, an astronaut, and later uh, the army. So <laughs> all these things combined as a youngster. Do you re do you remember? Was it Radio Luxembourg? Yeah, I used to listen to Radio Luxembourg on a small transistor radio late at night when I should have been sleeping and getting yes! ready for school. <laughs> I was exactly the same. I used to just drift off the street listening to Radio Luxembourg and it was just brilliant. On a small radio, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In my mind, they were kind of like the new Radio Caroline. Yeah, you, that's you, right. I, yeah. I, 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 might, I might have been making a mal connection there, but but so Radio yeah. Caroline was a ship, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. The, the DJs that went to sea and uh, could play what they liked and not have to pay royalties, or I'm guessing, or... Well, they all became Radio One DJs. Car Radio Caroline was um, the uh, uh, foundations of BBC Radio One's pop DJs. You know, Tony Blackburn and Jimmy Young and all these DJs were on Caroline at the time, and the BBC brought them onto the station. And um, Radio One was born, you know, the pop tastic station, where after many years of radio uh, on pirate radio. I went from there uh, and uh, on kiss radio and then kiss became legal. I spent, I think nine years on uh, the legal side of kiss. And then I, when it became a commercial station and then I was uh, poached and approached by BBC radio one and I joined radio one and I was there for seven years on a primetime Saturday night slot. So I'd climbed the uh, radio ladder um, from a relatively unknown, obscure soul DJ at two o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, when there was probably like a handful of people listening to 
um, playing to millions of people internationally on BBC Radio 1. So I'm very proud of that achievement as well. And I'm really passionate about radio. Um, I still produce radio shows. I have a show on forceradio.net, which is a news station. Um, Phil Campion is on that station and uh, other former military uh, DJs and presenters uh, the station is made up of. Uh, that's forceradio.net. So I'm on there Saturday, seven to nine weekly. Mm. Is that kind of, is that military orientated or is it, are they freedom orient? How does that it, Well, it's military orientated. It's a, it's a new um, independently backed station. It's along the, uh, the lines of forces radio, that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I remember getting interviewed on Forces Radio and not that long ago. And what, what is it? They Just before they my interview finished, they said, uh, and it, it was live as well, I think, and they said, um, "What what's your recommendations then, Chris, for curing PTSD? And I said, well, let's stop sending them to these Mickey Mouse wars. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they kind of... But, <laughs> chuckled a bit uh, uh, letters of complaint were there <laughs> yeah well possibly to the radio station I, I never got any oh nothing like a bit of controversy is there mm. you know it's what makes makes radio go with a bit of a bang but um one uh, one of the uh, i think best radio moments because radio is pretty faceless was phil campion chasing a forces radio presenter who was cocky to him around the studio um on a live stream <laughs> I think for me, that's one of the ultimate classic radio moments. Big Phil and this um, uh, rather uh, mouthy um, uh, drive time radio presents on Forces Radio who overstepped the mark. <laughs> I, saw, I saw video. I think Phil put that on one of his channels. <laughs> that's classic radio, that is. But uh, mm. yeah, so music, I love music. And um, this whole thing has, uh, it's, it's done so much. Uh, devastation to all different um, fields of industry and business. And um, our uh, club scene has been impacted greatly in the festival scene and the live music circuit. And it's been really hard for mm. uh, 18 months, but you know, there's been a, a, a turning point in the summer and I've been pretty busy since uh, July the 19th, which was billed as freedom day. Um, and I played in Bristol that day and it was a, Incredible day, hot sunshine. Everyone was so excited to be out dancing and enjoying themselves and interacting with other people. And, um, yeah, it's been a good run. So hopefully there's not going to be another kind of a restriction where uh, everything closes again because there's enough devastation that has been done. And um, the industry has further <clears throat> going to be impacted with the... Um, introduction and this is what we're opposing of this uh, passport that um, is completely wrong it's unethical and uh, we are opposing that and I'm part of the together declaration.org um, which is a very strong initiative which is uh, supporting hospitality all different uh, industries and a general opposition towards this pass. Um, there is no place for it in our open democratic society. And I've spent a lot of time campaigning over the last three months since the inception of uh, Together Declaration and um, part of the committee. I have played a voluntary role on the committee and uh, do a lot of work within that campaign group. Uh, because uh, I ha have contributed so greatly to the music scene in this country and to see where things are heading. We look at Scotland and the introduction to it uh, this past has got off to a very, very bad start. Uh, businesses are down. Their trade is down 40, 50 percent. Um, you know, there's had logistical um, complications and it just doesn't work. It's unnecessary and we don't want it. And uh, the young people, the young kids, uh, you've got uh, James from Wales, um, the student guy. Is it James? What's his surname? Um, uh, is it James Martin? What's his name? The young student guy, students for action. Um, you know, he's, what's his name? He's uh, putting out some really um, uh, positive stuff. But, you know, uh, how it is, this has impacted his life and other, uh, you know, students and, you know, the 18 to 
21 group you know they've been denied all all the freedoms and the good times and going out without any restrictions and you know kind of coming of age and going to the pub or whatever you know over the last couple of years they haven't had that pleasure yeah, it must be yeah. very, very hard. It's hard for everyone, but particularly for the youngster, you know, the young community, you know, how it's impacted them. And he's a great spokesperson for uh, the um, 18 to 21 year olds in, in this country. Yeah, that's James Harvey, isn't it? That's it, James Harvey. Yeah, yeah. he was, he, yeah, he was great. good enough to come on uh, one of our GVA podcasts. Yeah, yeah. And this is, I've said this a lot, you know, Again, taking it back to veterans, we didn't fight and our colleagues die so that on your 18th birthday, you rock up at a nightclub and some boots on the ground, blooming doorman goes, sorry, mate, you ain't coming in, but but all your mates can. Yeah. And who's the person that's not allowed in? Well, it's the one that actually believes in eating well. Yeah. Um, you know, a bit of moderate exercise. Health conscious. Boosting, boosting their natural immunity, yeah. they're the ones being penalised. Clearly, that doesn't make sense. So you know someone's fish. You know you you you, yes. you 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 know this passport system is is um, there's something needs to be questioned about it. Uh, you you could say. Well, it's morally wrong, and it's creating a uh, segregated uh, society, which it has in Scotland and Wales, because they are ahead of England. Um, Ireland also is going through this. Um, the European uh, countries, Australia, is really, really terrible what's going on in Australia, which isn't reported on the mainstream media. It's a news blackout, what's going on down there. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot, you know, a lot of friends that are really terrified and they're you know they're in states of anxiety you know they've lo- they've lost their jobs their um their businesses um they cannot go to certain places you know that isn't that that, that is not acceptable you know th- this is not what life's about it's unacceptable and we do not want it here and that's why we are opposing it with a together declaration and i'm urging other everybody to uh, sign the charter at togetherdeclaration.org. Join us and support us and um, let's show our opposition towards uh, this, uh, this, this plan and these proposals. Um, there is no, no, there, there is no, no, no segregation in society. No, we in don't. Any form. We don't have apartheid in Britain. Absolutely not. You know, no. we saw we saw that in South Africa and 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 how hideous it can get, and the, and then the uh, hatred. Yeah, it just absolutely. starts to develop hatred from birth in in indifference yeah. and, and division that actually doesn't exist because we're all yeah. one humanity. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we we be, we get on better as humans when everyone is succeeding and doing well. Yeah. Not, not by suppressing a certain element of society and and that that's yeah yeah that's alan miller isn't it is yes uh, alan miller is um he's the founder of um uh, uh the together declaration group uh alan was also the founder of the nighttime industries association which i supported uh uh from its inception um he he's a great uh campaigner and he puts together uh strong groups of people that make a difference. And that's what we're doing. We're, um, we're making a difference and um, we're standing for what's right and not supporting anything that is, is wrong. And there's a lot, there's a lot that's very wrong with what, you know, these things that are being drafted in and, you know, swept through in, you know, kind of 40 minute debates, which is again, completely wrong. Yeah. It's, um, you know, we have to be careful because if we take our eye off the ball, like, for example, they did in Cambodia and there's numerous other examples worldwide, you know, you're in, you're inviting tyranny. Yeah. Because not everyone's as nice as you. Yeah. Some people have agendas yeah. and we have to keep on top of that. Yeah, I've been to Cambodia. It's a wonderful country and I certainly know that I'm going to go and visit there again in the future because travel is not going to be restricted. Um, uh, Travel and freedom to travel are fundamental human rights, our inalienable 
um, sovereign rights to travel freely any place of our choosing across the world. And that is going to return. Um, so Cambodia, um, I have been to the Killing Fields Museum and it, it really is. It's a very disturbing experience of the um, genocide that went on in that country and how that happened um, and people turning against each mm -hmm. other. And, haunting, um, haunting, haunting that museum, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Um, it, it, it really um, puts up close the scale of, uh, of the human suffering that went on there and um, the division and the manipulation of society. And these, uh, uh, these atrocities cannot be repeated. They cannot be repeated, but we're in danger of this history. Well, let, let, let's not mince our words here, here Danny. It, it is being repeated. Well, yeah. Once you start to silence the intellectuals, yeah. which is what they did in Cambodia, yeah. and, then, and, and then you find excuses to segregate them from the, which is what happened at Tool Slang, the, the torture museum, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's already happening and we need to be realistic about this, where freedom of speech is being stifled. Voices of dissent that say, hang on, and you know, have you thought about it? That they're, they're not being allowed to speak. They're being cut out of the mainstream uh, narrative completely. And, and um, it, what they wanted in Cambodia in, in a very, my amateur synopsis, they just wanted a, a kind of peasant population. So people that were kind of farmers that couldn't really think much outside the box, yeah. controlled, head down. Um, yeah. And, and um, when you look at, I mean, just take this country, but it's not this country. It's like you say, it's Australia, Canada, da, da, da. But, but look at the, when you look at the people that just go along with this blatant, flagrant loss of freedom, then you can see the parallel with Cambodia. The, the ones that don't question, that don't, they're not going to rock the boat. Mm. Um, yeah. Let's get back to the music, Danny, because... Um, yeah, we've heard, of course, a little there. Yeah. I know, it's absolutely <laughs> fine. It, it, it needs to be said, and I know there's many beautiful people out there that will be so pleased we've had this conversation. Because yeah. they'll, either, they'll either know it or they've certainly been thinking about it. Well, one thing is we're standing on the right side of history and we will stand in our values, in our truth and in our sovereign power. That is our role here. And we will uphold that. Yes, exactly. And um, everyone needs to look themselves in the mirror and say, what, what did you do when it came for the children? What did you do? Because, you know, I don't want to sound threatening or, or fearful. It's not, I, th I think fear creates division, but you know, you are responsible for your actions. Indeed. And there is, there is repercussions, you know, for every action, there's a equal and opposite. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm gone a bit off, 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 off point, but um, it's not enough to just hold your hands and say, yeah, but what it was, I wanted my two weeks in Sharm El Sheikh uh, or... or <laughs> Yeah, but what it was, I was a school teacher. I had to do it. It's like no, that mm. that doesn't. Mm. That's called the Nuremberg defense. It, yes, it's it's, it's yeah. dangerous ground. You have to stand firm and say no. Yeah, it's that simple. Nothing will happen to you. Yeah, nothing will upholding your inalienable rights, as Danny said. Nothing will happen to you. Yeah, have courage. Um, have courage. Have faith, mm. and stand in one sovereign power. And yeah. I think uh, during the cr just uh, the crisis that came about, uh, particularly the um, lockdown period, I think it gave a lot of people um, time alone and time in their thoughts to really evaluate the, uh, our lives, who we are as people, what life means, um, how we want to how we want the world to be, how we want to live in the world. And I think there was a, there's been a major shift in consciousness, which um, is happening right now, and, and also a major realisation of personal sovereignty. Personal sovereignty is not being an anarchist. Personal sovereignty is self-responsibility. Do no harm. Do not break any laws. Um, be kind to be other people. 
and stand yeah. united. You know, these are just the basic core values of life in general. Yeah. And I think uh, this time that we have been isolated has been productive for, uh, for a, a huge group of people who didn't choose to just sit on the couch and sit back and watch every single box set that's available on Netflix, you know. They've taken time to read more books, um, l- look at information uh, online that's empowering, um, take courses that are empowering, online courses. And that's one of the positives that has come out of a very negative uh, set of circumstances. Yeah. And let's not forget how many wonderful people we've all met through this, you know. Yeah. Genuine crusaders, kind-hearted warriors yes. that, that just love children and, and are willing to put the children first. And in yes. my book, welcome aboard, isn't it? You know, you know, really, it, it's really made you analyse who you associate with. And I don't mean this in terms of division. Yeah. But when you've got to keep your vibration up, which is really important in life, and then you look at individuals and think, well, hang on. How much, and it's maybe not their, um, it's probably not their fault. Yeah. But it's like, you call me names because I love people. Yeah, because I, because I like to read books and I like to learn history and, and see where tyranny comes at you, you. You like label me as this or that. Yeah. And no disrespect. I still love you and I always will. But yeah, like I don't want to wake up to you in my life that, I want yeah. to wake up to people like Danny and people that yeah. that, that uh, realise we're these b- beautiful human beings. Yeah. And this is an incredible universe and we are universe. We are a part of it and we have every right to be here. Absolutely. Um, On our terms. And it's crazy to me now that it's just, it's really just so negative to be around people that, only know the mainstream narrative and again no judgment i used to be like that i'm sure we all were at one point but when you got people yeah do you see the statistics on the and how do you explain it no i haven't watched news for 20 years i i I get what it is i know who owns the news companies i know what what why they put these narratives out and ah anyway independent uh, independent you media uh, represent um, factual information, you know, kind of, uh, and it's in real time. It's mm. there. New media is media of the people. It, it, new yeah. media is media that's presented by real people and not massive corporations that own everything and direct and narrate it. How, how much would you say, Danny, and I don't know, like how much you were into the substances. I, as, as anyone who's read my memoirs will know, I, I never had a problem with the dance scene. You used to go out, take a few pills. Yeah. Bit of this, but it, 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 it I'm not, I'm not saying it, it was always brilliant and there weren't some awful come downs and some, probably yeah. some stupid behavior, but it was when I got to Hong Kong and someone went, Oi, Chris, have you ever tried this crystal meth? That, oh, that's good grief. That's when it that triggered my childhood trauma in a way where well, it didn't trigger it. It was the key I thought in the lock. Mm. And that's that's a dangerous thing when you think you found your potion and then it, and it makes you feel normal for the first time in your life. What now spirituality makes me realize I'm completely, you know, normal, right? But back then it was experimenting. Mm. But um yeah, I just wondered uh, how you, how 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 did you negotiate that sort of as a DJ? Well, I didn't. I never worked in um, you know kind of uh, that uh, state. Uh, you know, kind of a um, altered state. Mm. Um, uh, there were a lot of recreation, um, and I, you know, I, I don't personally didn't. I don't think it was that, you know, that harmful. It opened um, a lot of people's minds at that time as well. And it created a wave of empathy and it brought a lot of people together. It really did deconstruct everything. And um, people came together like uh, they hadn't before. You know, it was one tribe. It wasn't like all these um, um, 
uh, different tribes, you know, kind of, um, it became one tribe, the whole dance movement. And it, it, a lot, so much positivity came out of that time in um, the Summers of Love of 88 and 89. You know, uh, youth culture changed dramatically and um, careers were born, businesses, babies, uh, lifelong relationships and friendships. There was so much positivity, um, bringing people opportunity, bringing people together, the unity aspect of it, the collective consciousness. And I think what we see at rallies right now, in my opinion, because I was at the helm of all of that, there is a very, very parallel collective consciousness of the human spirit that you get at these large rallies um, around, around the world, the freedom rallies, um, the, the core collective consciousness, the spirit of unity is very, very parallel, but without the music and everything else that went on then, uh, very parallel in terms on a conscious level. And that is powerful. When mm. groups of people come together and that collective energy, that creates a shift and it creates a change, as it did back then uh, within the, the electronic music and dance world and, uh, you know, kind of youth tribes. Um, and there was no ageism then either. That uh, ageism has crept back into society and all this kind of marginalised, pigeonholed, you're part of this and part of that and this one's right and that one's right. So that's all great, yeah. But, you know, kind of at that time, everything became unified. And that was a really incredible experience. And I think that's, you know, this is where we're heading now with this this whole shift that's going on. Mm. But um, anybody who's been to a large rally will uh, um, uh, will confirm that the energy is very, 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 very positive, and it gives people's morale a huge lift. Then they do not feel alone. There are other people around them that are also of a uh, connected mindset and consciousness, and it's a very positive experience because we're, you know, we are all uh, flying the flag of freedom and unity and human rights. Yes, one thing that. It'd be good to mention here. I'm I'm really big on um, social influencers. I mean to control the what I, I call it the agenda, right? When you got people on a remote Polynesian island and they're all, let's say, wearing certain things on their face and 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 diving in the bushes when their next door neighbour works walks past, aka social distancing. You know this isn't there's something more to this right because it ain't just london and boris johnson is it this is global right this is i call it agenda mm. and when i look back and it's not a new thing it's probably hundreds of years in in the making this thing and when i see how music has been co-opted or or uh um infiltrated let's say to keep what i call people in their infant mind so to sever that connection from the universe yeah and the way music does it is it's all like lovey dovey oh i'm no good i need you to be a human i miss you oh you left me oh. <laughs> and it's all it's all to lower your vibration and get, <laughs> get you to think that you're a useless worthless human being that needs someone else to to and the with the house music it was the polar opposite it absolutely was, we are one tribe we are one world we are perfect as we are you know um etc etc and it, when i listen to those songs now and i love to do it when i go running down here yeah you know just infinite possibility comes from those house music tracks oh. Absolutely, and the frequency uh, kind of uh, of the, uh, the the positivity that emanates from the melody and the um, lyrics of all of those early um, early productions um, underpinned the change that was happening as well. There was all different components to what actually happened then, and they all merged together, and then this whole movement was born. Mm. And as I said, I see parallels with what happened then happening now in a different form 
massively. It's and it's to pick out these um, pertinent moments. Uh, there's a word for it in in, in spirituality. Um, ah, it slipped my mind, but you know, let's not all forget, folks. Those of us that experienced that era, we did it for a reason, and it's all coming good now. And it's put something in our hearts and our minds that that other people can't take that away from us. And it works to our advantage. Absolutely. Our, yeah. Um, how was it then? Because uh, uh, I used to chuckle driving along in a car on a Saturday night. You're off to the, you know, off to the the dance warehouse or whatever. And, yeah. And, and on BBC would come. Um, hey, and, and it, I mean, your name is the name I remember the most when I think about BBC Radio, because it was Danny Ramplin, Danny Ramplin. It was, you just, but I used to chuckle because they'd get, they'd get these phone-ins, wouldn't they? And they're people all driving back from the um, <laughs> dance nights out, the festivals, and the, yeah, we're, we're going back to Kent, blah, blah, blah. And in my <laughs> mind, I'm just picturing people like, like, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and yet the BBC, obviously, with their... Um, sanitized version of life <laughs> skirted very much around the subject of substance use didn't they they it, it literally like never they 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 wanted to get in on the dance scene um but they did it on their terms i just wondered if that was ever like an issue oh, I, or oh well that they did because uh, when acid house began and the rave scene they banned the shame and they banned couple of acid records and said it was a you know, kind of um uh, uh well they sensationalized it but uh, they did the same thing with punk you know it's kind of like punk records were banned off the playlist but what it done it, it what it did it just created more sensationalism for people to like come and like take part in it and like great what's this new music so but then they kind of mellowed out into the early 90s and you know i'm glad they invited me on there but when i invite when i um, was invited on there initially I, I was kind of like I was I, I was quite taken back in the sense that I drove into Leicester one night to a gig and there's this massive billboard 30 feet by like 15 feet high with my face on it saying and they didn't tell me this was going to happen so it was placed on the motorway into Leicester and the caption was I'm a, a dance music I, I'm a I'm a dance music DJ not a chat show host <laughs> I obviously lifted that um, caption from uh, one of my interviews, but I, I just thought, man, this is like really serious. You know, I've joined, joined this st uh, station and now I'm not, you know, just on the radio broadcasting to London and the South East with Kiss. You know, this is like speaking to the whole country. So, um, I mean, looking back on it, that was a, a marvellous experience, but at the same time, very daunting initially, you know, kind of that, um, jump from just a, a city to all the cities around the UK. And I love playing around the UK. You know, people say, where's your favourite place in the world to play? Well, I've played all over the world and, I, I, you know, I love Ibiza and I love America and Asia and Australia. But yeah, you know, playing on home turf is always very close to my heart and I, mm. I love it. I've been to every city across the UK. I've put, you know, as many miles in as Eddie Stobart's lorries over the years. <laughs> but I don't travel so much on the on on the motorway by car these days. I prefer to get the train. Yeah. You know, get the train and I'll stay in the city if it's Newcastle or something, then get on the first train out in the morning at eight o'clock or eight thirty and then get home and have a bit of Sunday. But yeah, I, I just love the UK. And um, at that time when I was on radio, one on Saturday night, it was a soundtrack to people getting ready to go out on a Saturday night. You know, it really got people pumped up and in the party mood across the land and everyone. And it was a great decade, the 90s. The 90s was a hedonistic, uh, free, um, you know, um, uh, uh, a decade of fun and parties and Britpop and um, super clubs and clubbing and music and um, compilations and uh, um, mix albums and, uh, you know, fashion and um uh, and uh, available credit and the economy was doing okay and people had disposable income. It was, it was just an incredible decade for everybody. Did you ever play Hong Kong? I did. The first time I played in Hong Kong, it was in a karaoke club. 
So there'd been like your experience of Hong Kong. There'd been some karaoke earlier in earlier on in the club, and then the club turned into a nightclub, and that was for Lee Burridge, uh, the DJ Lee Burridge. He invited me to play in Hong Kong, and it was it was a wonderful experience. I've played Hong Kong a number of times over the years. It's a city I love. It's changed dramatically in recent years, and it's got its it's got its problems there, like you know, kind of everywhere in the world right now. But um, I love Hong Kong as a city. Lee, I remember Lee came up to me in the Big Apple Club and we were we were chatting and this was before he became an international name. And uh, he went, you want a beer, Chris? <laughs> like, yeah, I'll have a... Was it Corona, I think, we used to drink? Yeah. You want to come back with a, with a Corona and it's funny just to think that we're, there's us chatting in this grungy nightclub in Hong Kong and now he's uh, he's playing like Burning Man and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, Lee's a great guy, really, really good guy. But uh, yeah, so you was out there in his kind of early days of his career, really. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was there when it all kick, kicked off in Hong yeah. Kong. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, I mean, I just remember how it all, all sort of happened. I remember, I suppose, like mid nineties. Yeah. Uh, gosh, can I say there, there's a certain substance that's very easy to get hold of in Hong Kong, and it's <laughs> it's like bloody strong not 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 what people are getting here and no folks we're not advocating any of this stuff no. i'm just i'm just mm-hmm. telling you like my experiences and yeah some a, a lot of djs fell foul of that kind of thing didn't they it, it you you can you can go for so long djing and then you start to go downhill mentally i mean well i think it's like you know anything in it, it you know in life you know kind of when something feels good and it becomes addictive, then it becomes a problem. Um, and fortunately, you know, over the years, I've always kept fit. I've always, you know, kind of, I eat healthy. I cook my own food um, and uh, I take care of myself. And that's really, you know, important. But, um, you know, some people can have like, you know, go down the pub and have two beers and go home. I find that quite difficult. I prefer like five or six beers, but, you know, I don't like get up in the morning and have a beer for breakfast or, you know, a bottle of scotch. But, you know, it affects anything, any, any, uh, 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 any uh, chemical induced uh, sense of, uh, you know, escapism. People can become very, very addictive and it becomes destructive. And that destructive behaviour is based in core issues of childhood. And that's where the roots of addiction are. And um, I think, you know, kind of some people uh, have come through uh, the whole music scene in particular. You see it with rock bands, everything, and others have just like, you know, kind of wasted uh, themselves and their careers. And some people have lost their lives through addiction, many people. But, um, Mm. yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that decade of of the 90s was, it was a party decade, you know, let's, you know, and everybody was having the time of their lives. It was, it was a time of such freedom and, and fun. And, you know, I'm glad that we were, you know, kind of all around during that decade and contributing to it. You know, it was. So what, um, there's so much I'd love to ask you. First of all, did you like the film It's All Gone Pete Tong? Um, no, I thought it was a bit, um, I thought it was, a, to be honest, I, I, I didn't particularly like that film. I prefer human traffic. I think human traffic ah. is the, is the mo- most realistic definitive of count that, um, captures the spirit of those times, a bloody brilliant film and train spotting as well. But those other films I thought were, I don't know. I just, they were kind of like comedy, but I, I didn't really find them funny. <laughs> you know uh, the the, 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 the uh, all gone was all about uh the deaf guy wasn't it which it had yeah. like, it, it had a, like a, th- a, a a topical issue an important issue because i'm half deaf but that that's from firing an 84 millimeter in brecon but <laughs> nothing to do with like dj <laughs> yeah right bad sound systems but uh yeah no i my favorite out of all of these films that have been produced is definitely human traffic, you know, which, um, which DJs did you get along well with? I get along with all DJs. Um, you know, we're all, you know, kind of, um, uh, 
we're all in the same industry, but you know, there aren't many DJs that, you know, kind of don't get along with as such, you know, mm. I mean, th- this thing that's happened now, I mean, our industry is, yeah, kind of, there's, I don't know. It's, uh, you know, kind of people have gone along with it and that's their choice. You know, I'm very pro choice, but you know, there's a, you know, I, I, this morning, I, you know, there was people that, you know, I've been friends with and I've, ca- I come under a lot of flack for speaking my mind and standing in my truth as we all do. And the amount of like insults and abuse, I, you know, I, I, I could shrug it off generally because I rise above it. But this morning it kind of affected me and I just thought, you know, it's just low, you know, you know, I just delete that crap, but you know, it does affect you sometimes. You mm. think, what's going through your mind to actually start insulting someone who's actually been a friend and you've drank with and you've played in the same booth with? It's just like, it's like, come on, you know, come yeah, on, what, it, what are you trying to achieve here? You're making yourself look bloody stupid because we have a difference of opinions and a viewpoint. You've got to resort to insults and abuse, you know. There's, no, I don't take kindly to that. It's like, go away. You know, don't don't come on here. Don't come into my house and insult me because you'll be shown the door straight away. And that's what I do. I just block these people and move on. Yeah, I but, do get it. I can see there's certain uh, individuals on the DJ scene that are just going right along with it to make their oh. lives to make their lives easier. And 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 maybe it's naivety as well. And I get it. Danny, I get it. Can you give us any names then of some good time? I mean, I met Brandon in uh, Hong Kong and and Alex, which was quite... uh, Yeah, in their heyday, their wild years. (laughs) Yeah, we're still friends to this day. uh, Yeah, good. Yeah, Uh, they're great guys. They're all great guys. You know, we we all get along. Uh, You know, we... We're, you know, playing on the same gigs together and stuff and, you know, catch up and have a bit of a laugh like... You know, kind of you do with your, you know, a lot of your military buddies and stuff. Mm. You know, it's, you know, well, you know, we're all doing the, the, the same thing and bringing pleasure to people in the, like the DJ arena and having a great time. Um, at the, you know, at the same time playing music and sharing music and getting that vibe going, and that's, you know, it's very, it's very addictive and it's a wonderful connection to have with the audience and that rapport. You know, it's a, it's a massive natural high. It's just, you know, kind of, and every gig is different. But, uh, you know, I always strive to be better than my last gig. And if I've had, might get, the, it happens, seldom happens. But you might get the odd gig that might be played with a few difficulties or technical difficulties or sometimes, you know, the vibe might not be right. But then, you know, the next time you step out, you know, it's just, that's gone. It's done, you know, it's not to be repeated, but the occasional one will crop up. That's life. You know, you could have like a piece of equipment go down or something, or, you know, kind of people not in the, you know, kind of right, the right space. But I, I endeavor to get them in that space. That's what I do. I'm, you know, I'm a, a shaman. I'm a musical shaman. You know, I bring the energy to, as we all do. We bring the energy to the room and we lift that energy. Have you ever, when you've been mixing between two tracks, have you ever really screwed it up? Does that happen? No, of course, of course we all have. And that's how you learn. But, you know, in the early days, you know, I wasn't like, you know, kind of the, you know, kind of immediate, like kind of, you know, master mixer. It takes time to refine the craft. There's different levels of ability with rhythm. But, you know, when I, you know, had clunky mixes, just chop straight out of them. You know, it's like... And you know what? It's a split second. But you, well, you don't stay in the trouble. You get out of it quickly. Yeah. Get out. <laughs> you know, everything's smashing about. In, out. <laughs> that's that's always been my my you know exit point out. That it can happen. You know, particularly in the vinyl days. You know, you know yes. things can go turntable can wander, and then you're in the territory of clustering sounds. As much as you're trying to get that mix back, I would just like cut out of it. It, it's gone, you know, it's kind of rather than like, oh, you know, kind of panicking a bit and, you know, kind of, it's the same when, you know, equipment goes down and stuff, you know, kind of on the back in the vinyl days, I'd like, you know, kind of uh, when CDs were first introduced, you know, kind of like I'd push the stop. I Occasionally I'd hit the stop button on the one that was playing. It's like, 
oh shit, what's happened here? You know, and everyone has done that. Every single DJ has done it, and every single DJ has experienced you know a, a mix that didn't go right. And that's how you know, particularly when you're starting out, that's how you learn. If I hit the stop button, I'd go right. It's a two minute silence for Bob. <laughs> People jeering, boo. <laughs> people, <laughs> but, um, going, people going home. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, kind of, it's it, it's all experience, isn't it? And, mm. you know, kind of, uh, my first experience was in um, Spain and um, it was the first ever DJ gig that I was, I thought I'd made it, I got this job in a club. I lasted um, a couple of hours because um, the, there was a power cut and back then in the 80s, there was, you know, kind of, Spain was power cuts in, you know, 70s and 80s were commonplace. Mm. Anyway, the power, a cut long story shut, power went down and the owner of the club, he said, hey, just get on the mic and tell some jokes. And I'm bloody hopeless at telling jokes because I can never remember them. <laughs> and um, I said, well, I can't tell any jokes. He said, well, how about a wet T-shirt contest? Just come on, interact with the audience. And I wasn't very... I wasn't very confident on the mic at all. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm here. I'm just here to play the music. They said, oh, my friend, then you have to go then. So that was the end of my my um, residency in Spain. And I just, uh, I, you know, kind of, I, I was so inexperienced. But, hey, you know, you, I didn't give up. I went back and then, I, you know, kind of not in that club. I, I wasn't welcome back there because I, 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 I wasn't a comedian and I wasn't very mic proficient. So I was very like a newbie. You know, I was just starting out. But, uh, you know, you, you, you have your setbacks in anything in life. You just keep going, don't you? If you're determined, you get back up and you dust yourself down and you keep going and you push on. Did you ever meet Avicii by any chance? Um, no, I didn't meet him actually. Yeah, it's a very sad story, isn't it? I met his um, road manager once in uh, Holland um, on an event I was playing at. He was on uh, an event uh, there also. Uh, I didn't meet him in person, no. No. I just, uh, of all those people in history that you'd like to meet, he, uh, he, he would just be one of them. Uh, I, I listen to his tracks quite a lot when I go yeah. running. Yeah, he was a very talented uh, uh, producer and DJ and, mm -hmm. yeah, massive, massive star. And um, the pressure and fame of his touring and everything and alcoholism and it got to him. And, yeah, um, it's a tragic story. But, you know, God bless his soul, really tragic story. And that's that's a tale of the excesses of both work life and um, mm -hmm. alcohol and... Um, uh, uppers and downers you know a pill to get to sleep and a pill to wake you up you know he got into that kind of prescriptive um medication and stuff and um you know being in demand across the world it's you know it, it was too much for the i think for, when you sign guy. when you sign these big music contract they want their pound of flesh out you don't they and they 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 just exploited him they did unfortunately yeah absolutely tragic but that's you know the, the tragedy of uh, some of the artists in music, you know, kind of that uh, cannot cope with it. And um, just a, a really sad story. So, yeah. So Danny, to, to finish, we're going to finish on a positive, but to, yeah. go, to the, go to the negative first, it, it, what, what's been your worst moment, DJ? <laughs> oh, you can give a few examples if, if, <laughs> if some come to mind. Worst moment. Uh, well, I've, I remember I played in Jersey one night, and again it was like a power issue. And I played, I played three minutes of one record in Jersey. You know, kind of can't just like get on another plane and go home at midnight. Um, and within three minutes, the electricity had gone gone down in the in the venue. And I thought, well, it'll come back on. It didn't come back on, so the gig was ruined. But I mean, there's been plenty of things, you know, kind of missed flights, and you know, kind of. I remember I went to Poland once and um, uh, what happened in Poland, there was this, uh, uh, this problem with the sound system in this coastal town, I think it was near Gdansk or something. We got there, I didn't end up playing because there was, first there was a sound issue that they were trying to rectify and then this storm came in and um, 
that gig didn't happen. And the same in um, Acapulco. Uh, there was a, um, an electric storm that happened there and it was torrential rain and turned up in Mexico. It was the first time that I was playing in Mexico and, it, and this rain just came down on the storm. And I, I played, but it was very, very difficult and challenging because the rain had kept everyone out off the festival site, apart from the diehards, and it, it rained everyone off. It was just playing under this... Um, just tarpaulin and the water was coming through so it was a pretty precarious situation but i mean i mean they're kind of few and far between really did you did you see the cliff divers in acapulco no i didn't know i was only there for like i think it was one night so i didn't get to see that either yeah. amazing amazing have you done that yes brilliant yeah i saw the elvis when elvis died was yeah. it summer of 77 or 76 yeah, yeah. they they played his movies all all summer holidays and one of them was going loco in acapulco or elvis in acapulco whatever it was called and it was for for friends at home if you haven't seen it it's elvis goes to acapulco and he ends up uh doing the infamous dive of las Clablada, i think the cliff is called off off the big cliff that the locals do um fearlessly and it's 42 meters high. Yeah. So to give anyone an idea, that that's that's the height that most people jump to, can I say commit suicide? Mm. These these guys do it yeah. part of the show. And when I got so I'm one of these people, Danny, I always put stuff on a back burner in my mind. I never say never. Like if I get the chance, I'm gonna do it, right? When I rocked up in Acapulco traveling the world. First place uh, after I left Mexico City, the first place I wanted to go to was the cliff. So uh, in Acapulco to see the cliff, and I wandered down to the cliff. Out, it's like it's outside a hotel complex, and I saw the changing room for these guys. Yeah, and it's got Las Clavadistas, the divers on the on the thing with a star or something. And yeah, marvelous. I thought, I thought. Oh my God, I can go in the changing room. And, <laughs> and I went in and literally it was pretty bleak in there. It was just some dumbbells on the floor for them to walk. That, that was it. And a, maybe a peg to hold your coat. Yeah. And the guy was mopping out. And I said, hola, hola, como esta? Yeah, todo bien. Um, and in, in my fractured Spanish, I'm, I, I said, so, you know, where are these cliff darts? And he said, oh, I'm... I'm I'm Salvador. I'm a cliff diver. I'm just, I'm like a child <laughs> in a sweet shop by this day. This is what I love about Brilliant. life. I love yeah. these things about life. You know, I saw this Elvis movie and now I'm, I'm there talking yeah. to one of, and he said, uh, Vam, Va, Vamos Nadar, do you want to go and swim? I thought he meant in the hotel swimming pool. So I'm like, si, bueno. So we walked out. And rather than go right to the hotel, he starts walking down to the cliff. The next thing I know, he's stripping his shirt off. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm following suit. He's still on this uh, parapet. And even to get into the lagoon, it's it's like a, you know, five or six meter dive. And off he went. So I went after him. And the whole thing about... Well that, yeah, that, well, the whole thing about the dive that makes it so uh, infamous is that you have to wait for the wave to come in. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not deep enough. You're going to... That's right. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we dived in, and then you suddenly realise the swell is huge. Yeah. It's taking you 20 metres this way. Then it's swooshing you back again. And so I just started to make for the actual cliff. And historically, these guys always climb the cliff. It's just what what they do right you can go around the top way but these guys always climb the 42 meters so i climbed up and this guy salvador's like no senor no you know he thinks the tourist is gonna just hurt himself and um i was like it's okay i i climbed to i don't know maybe 10 meters yeah and i turned and i did a swallow dive and to say dream come true, dream 
come true, Danny, you know? Well, yeah, it was, yeah. The experience of that, brilliant. Yeah, it's something that we should all do. <laughs> yes, live your dreams, one life, that's it. Well, that's the thing. And um, just um, talking about, you know, kind of um, personal development, um, I'm very connected with um, a life remix, Mark Wilkinson's um, personal development life coaching company. And Mark's been a very uh, uh, great support through my own, uh, you know, kind of difficulties through, um, you know, kind of going from a full diary to no diary last year. So uh, I wrote the forward to Mark's book and I'm part of his, uh, his life coaching company and um, have trained to do a couple of other things through um, uh, Mark's help, uh, Life Remixed. But it's a really, really good book. And, um, you know, if you're going through career changes or all or, or manner of life changes, which I think, you know, kind of like a huge percentage of people are, it's a great um, book of Mark's experiences um, to read at this mm. time. You know, he's a very, yeah. very positive guy. Um, he's been a DJ internationally. He's been a friend for many years. And um, yeah, so I really, you know, kind of recommend Life Remixed um, coaching, um, um, uh, personal development coaching. Yes, and I would too, because I signed up for his course. Um, my philosophy is you, ne- you can never learn enough in life. and Exactly. And the other thing as well is it's good to be accountable. So if you say you're going to, I don't know, whatever it is, knock the booze on it, you, you've got someone going, how are you getting on? And you can chat about it, you know, and, and, and but to be, it's the accountable thing. So accountability, got, yeah, yeah, very important. I've been able to put stuff in my career in place. So I've just procrastinated about for years. And yeah. bang, once you're accountable, yeah. you do it in a week. And it's, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mark was on the show, so I'll put a link. Uh, that make yeah, him- it's just reminded me. I must watch that interview, Chris. Yeah, the only trouble when you um, when you chat with Mark is he's, he's always trying to borrow a tenner off you. <laughs> and you've got in to the, watch your, in the tenner bucket. <laughs> yeah, watch what watch your checkbook as well. <laughs> I haven't got one of those at the moment, but uh, <laughs> they've gone they've gone out of circulation, haven't they? Uh, but uh, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, I'm playing down your neck of the woods, actually, in Plymouth. Oh, yes. On New Year's Day. Whereabouts? Tell us and let's promote it. Uh, just have a look. Um, let's have a look. So my next gigs are at um, Ministry of Sound Classical. That's with the um, London Orchestra at Delaware Pavilion on uh, November the 26th, Friday, November the 26th. I'll be uh, playing a set there and um, introducing the orchestra. That's going to be a good gig, a pretty epic, spectacular gig. And then I'm playing on Saturday the 27th with Tall Paul and Seb Fontaine um, in Maidstone, Kent. And then in December the 4th, I'm playing at Clockwork Orange at Fabric in London. That's a big all day thing. And then the uh, the twelfth, I believe it is, we present in Leicester with DJ Alfredo from Ibiza, and then um, New Year's Day in Plymouth. Let's just get the club details. I love the way that, that doesn't roll off your tongue, Plymouth. We're we're up there with Paris and New York, mate. Well, I'm I haven't played Plymouth for quite some time, but um, yeah, I'll spend a couple of days down there, so we'll um, we'll meet up. Definitely. Do you know the venue? I'm trying to find it here on this feed. Just bear with me. Ah, right, got it. It's where? Where is it? It's, um, right, it's uh, New Year's Day, one p.m. till late. Oh, one p.m. Right, okay. So it's a it's a, a, an all day, probably one p.m. till midnight thing with uh, Ridney. It's at the Treasury. Is it the Treasury? Treasury? Yes. Yeah, Catherine Street, Plymouth. That's New Year's Day. Looking forward to that. Brilliant. So I'll try and wander down and see you. And uh... Well, you've got UK Column down in Plymouth, which is a great um, news channel as well. They're based in Plymouth, aren't they? Yes, yes. Um, they, 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 their name's been coming up a lot recently, no, no surprise. Yeah, I'm sure. They're a great media company. 
new me- new media, should I say, new independent media company. Yeah. Well, they've been yeah. going a few years, but they've uh, they've really taken centre stage in the last um, couple of years, haven't they? Yes, they do. They they, they see their backdrop. It's the it's Plymouth Hoe, where Sir Francis Drake famously uh, refused to not finish his game of bowls before sailing out to frazzle the the Spanish Armada. Yeah, brilliant. Yes. Uh, so last. Uh, Danny, I'll tell you what do. Just send me all that in a, in a little paragraph and I'll put it below our video so everyone can just save me having to, you know, do an internet search for it all. So last question then is uh, best moment. Got any particular highlight that stands out in your... Oh, there's, there's thousands of them. Um, but um, I think playing at George Michael's um, 30th birthday party in a film studio in West London was... Um, a, a high point um that was great playing in cape town uh on the uh, race course in cape town on the millennium eve uh, radio one did a broadcast all around the world and i was um uh dispatched to cape town which is a place i love and that was a great gig there was thirty five thousand people on this open air well this big open air event and that was a magnificent evening that really was and um you know, all the Knights of Ibiza, all the Shoon events um, in the um, 88, 89, all the recent Shoon events that I've put together. But, you know, kind of uh, in terms of promoting my own events at the moment with the Shoon brand, I've just um, put that on hold for the time being um, until things level out a bit, you know. Mm. Uh, Yeah, George Michael was a nice guy, wasn't he? He Yeah, he really was. So down to earth and he, got to oh, meet. he just got a freaking hammering in the met by the mainstream media, didn't he? He did, yeah. Unfortunately, like a lot of pop stars, but he was a, a very charming, down to earth guy, and um, you know, kind of had a chat with him and met him, and you know, totally down to earth, no no pretenses, just yeah, had a dance to the music. <laughs> Wasn't the greatest dancer though, if I remember. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Great singer, but his dancing skills were. You know, kind of with the, without the choreography, but then I was playing house music, and that was very early on. I think that was eighty eight that party, eighty eight, eighty nine. But he had a good dance. Mm. And so to finish off, what, what's your favourite dance track or house? Oh, blooming hell! <laughs> okay, all... off, off the top of my head, um, uh, Frankie Knuckles, your love. Brilliant. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to chip in. Um, I, I'm I'm really bad at remembering names. I, there's probably about twenty tracks that equally are just beautiful in my yeah. head. I do like um, where love is it? Where love lives? Alison? Yes, Alison, Alison Limerick again. Frankie Knuckles and David Morales. Timeless classic production. Yes, brilliant. Happy music, uplifting, positive music. Yes, what we need and what we can all learn from. Yeah. Uh, you can check out my um, my radio shows on Mixcloud under my page on Mixcloud, Danny Rampling Mixcloud. Uh, there's the Love Group Dance Party shows there and a weekly Saturday show on uh, between 7 and 9 on forceradio.net, which Brilliant. is all, all uplifting house sounds. We'll put all the links below the video, folks. So, Danny, stay on the line just so I can thank you properly and um, ask you if I can borrow a tenner. <laughs> but much love to you mate thank you so much for coming on the show next time someone asks you what the highlight of your career you can say being on chris rules bought the t-shirt podcast absolutely chris yeah. obvious obviously <laughs> um to our friends at home big love to you all thanks for tuning in i hope you you love this chat as much as i have if you can like subscribe or maybe don't like and don't subscribe it's this is what Freedom is all about. (laughs) And we'll see you next time. Yeah. Pleasure.